Okay, everybody, can I get your attention, please? Hello. Hello, good evening, and uh, welcome to Berlin Town Hall. Uh, it's rather underwhelming. Um, I'm Andy Parker. That is Oliver Morton, the uh, moderator in chief for CEC 14. Uh, we are here to facilitate a discussion about the statement that was distributed to you all at the beginning of the week. Ollie, do you want to say a few words? Sure. Um, actually, could we start off on the basis of town hall? Um, if everyone could um, turn to the people next to them and say hello, and if you don't know each other, introduce yourselves just so you know who each other are. We will at least pretend to be a community, please. Hello. Hi, right, man. Okay, that's, en that's enough community spirit for now. <laughs> Thank you. You will all be available to each other in the bar later. Um, so a little, few little words about what we're doing here, how we came to do this. Um, after the session on, gosh, was it just Monday, uh, Monday afternoon, where Steve presented a document to um, everyone who was there, Various people came up to Andy and I afterwards and thought that, and had various sorts of questions and some frank unease about what this was and what the process might be. We suggested to the organisers that it would be a good idea for the community to have a space to talk about this in a way that would not be... so that your options for, re for responding to what was going on were not limited to suggesting changes of wording, which is not what this process is about, or simply deciding not to sign, so that we could actually have a discussion of what was actually going on. The organisers gave us this space, but I should point out very clearly, this is a community space, this is a space for the participants at the conference, this is not um, a part of the conference in the sense of being a programmed thing. I should also point out at the same time um, that it is, as I understand it, the settled opinion of the conference organisers that no statement is coming out of this conference with the conference's imprimatio, um, that um, there's no way that anything is going to be presented in a way that it could be the conference's decision. Uh, there have been some media um, reports so far that have not fully taken this position on board. If you people who came in could try and find seats, there are still a lot of seats, we're actually going to be using that space at the back a bit. Um, and so that's basic, those are basically, um, that's basically where this came from. Because this is a community session that we convened to discuss um, what Steve had presented, what we're going to do is we're going to have Steve say a little bit, we're then going to have responses to that, but at the same time, as many of you know, I assume pretty much all of you know, Clive also um, asked people to distribute a document earlier today, and uh, later on in the um, proceedings, which will take more or less exactly one hour, um, Clive will be saying something about his document. I'd like to say this is in no way a battle of the bands, um, or B Berlin undoubtedly has talent, but that's not what we're here to decide. This is not a competition between two statements. It's a place to describe how you feel about the whole idea of such statements and what you worry about in either of them. But we're going to start off with Steve's, because that was the reason why we actually convened this in the first place. Um, I think that's me for now, isn't it? Oh, I that's should point out, this is an open forum and there are journalists here and we have no intention of making it under Chatham House rules. If you want to, it's a town hall, it's your town and you should feel free to speak your mind. So the format for the session, Steve will be up first, he'll have five or so minutes to impress the judges. We'll then have... <laughs> yeah, mixed messages, dude. <laughs> <laughs> we'll... How well you know Steve. We'll then have uh, uh, comments from the audience. So you'll see at either end of the room there are microphones on stands. If you would like to make a comment, then go and queue up at the microphone. We will give you the nod when it's your time to talk. Um, at our discretion, we may take follow-up questions, um, but we want to keep this snappy. We want to keep people moving, so please do not uh, give a speech from the microphone. It's not a chance to grandstand. Um, points to remember, we're here to discuss... Uh, ideas, the concept of the statement, processes for agreement and for discussion. We're not here uh, to wordsmith the statement. I don't want to hear any criticism uh, of specific words in there you don't like. There's plenty of time for that afterwards. Um, but we do welcome your opinions and ideas, so uh, form a cue at the microphone the moment you have something to say. In that spirit, I'd ask everyone who's anywhere near the microphone to move away from it and take a seat. Thank you very much. 
Both microphones are in use, yeah. So uh, go and queue up and we'll take oh, people yes. as in the order they can. Just come. to clarify, you, a few people asked, you have not in fact been allocated sides in some fictitious dis debate. We just felt this was a thing that was much better done with people looking at each other rather than people looking at the back of each other's heads. So you are not, you are not pre committed to a team, but you are nearer one mic <laughs> but you are nearer one microphone than the other microphone, and I ask you to use common sense on that. <laughs> and on that point, Steve. Give me a microphone. Yeah, we'll give Steve a microphone. Do I need a microphone? Yeah. Okay, yeah. all right, thank you. Um, let me start by offering a little bit more background than I was able to give on Monday. Uh, the background to what we presented as a potential Berlin Declaration draft is that the original authors of the Oxford Principles uh, have, for uh, the past two or three weeks, uh, been considering an open letter a, a, a draft open letter that we wanted to uh, open for signatory among uh, a wide group of people to address this issue of uh, the ground rules under which outdoor experimentation for SRM, particularly sulfate aerosols, uh, might be conducted. And then, I think it was actually last Thursday, uh, it occurred to us that rather than just following the conventional way of doing this, which is you have a small group of people who initially sign the letter and then circulate it, offering people only the choice of signing or not signing, it would be better to bring it to this forum, to the opportunity to get a wider level of feedback before we open that letter for, signatory, uh, for signature. So that was the, the, the background, uh, and I hope I made it clear on Monday that the object here is not to co-opt anybody or coerce anybody into being associated with a statement with which they were uncomfortable. Uh, and I hope I was very clear that that's why I said we weren't proposing that we actually bring this for an up and up or down vote for adoption or anything of that sort, but this would be entirely in, uh, open for individuals to decide whether or not to sign. Now, one of the pieces of feedback we've had, we've had about half a dozen uh, uh, pieces of feedback. In fact, 12 people specifically responded to the invitation that I opened on Monday to uh, email Tim. One was that people felt that the title of Berlin Declaration would implicate people even if they had individually opted not to sign. So an option for us is to revert to the original title that we were uh, going to uh, propose this under, which was an open letter on sulfate aerosol uh, experimentation. And so I'm going to open that up and see whether people think that that is a better option uh, than continuing with the Berlin Declaration. It may have less impact. But uh, that's a trade-off, and we're perfectly happy to be advised by the, the meeting uh, as to uh, that. With respect to the other pieces of um, feedback that we got, uh, there was some concern that uh, it was not strong enough. People would have preferred a ban on outdoor experimentation. Other people felt it was too restrictive. Uh, and as I said on Monday, what we're trying to do is to steer a pragmatic path between those two positions, we think a ban would not be sustainable. Um, and we also are very uncomfortable about the idea of giving some kind of carte blanche to the scientific community simply to proceed uh, with experimentation without being required to pay some attention to some significant professional norms, scientific uh, uh, norms and principles uh, of the sort that we feel were embodied initially in the Oxford Principles and subsequently in the Asilomar Principles and include, of course, the issues of public engagement, transparency, operating in the public interest, full and full, uh, full disclosure and so on, which have been reiterated in various forms uh, over the past four years since we originally promulgated the, uh, the Oxford version. Uh, the second uh, set of... And, and indeed, that is the position that we're taking. We are not actually... Uh, as the authors, original authors of this, we are not wanting to move either to a ban or to a carte blanche position. And if other people want to suggest those, by all means, uh, that's your prerogative to do so and to organise a, a letter accordingly. Uh, with respect to the scope of techniques, people said, oh, are we really talking about all um, uh, SRM experiments or are we talking specifically about uh, sulphate aerosol injection? Um, I think that's another one that we would like to open up for discussion here and get feedback uh, from people. It was our impetus that it was actually the sulfate aerosol injection that is really the most pressing 
uh, case because we feel this is the area which is A, most contentious, and B, where there is, in a sense, the highest level of pressure uh, towards uh, moving into an experimental phase. Um, people have also given us some feedback that they feel that some of the terminology in the draft is vague. What does public engagement actually mean? Uh, and I think necessarily one has to be a little bit uh, vague in trying to make a high-level statement of this, which would have international relevance, where, the, where the, uh, the political cultural traditions and so on that under which public engagement could take place will be highly variable. Uh, we will try and tighten that language, uh, but obviously if we, we, what we don't want to do is to get into some kind of um, cultural political imperialism whereby we lay out that there is a one single uh, size fits all model uh, that fits everywhere around the world. Um, finally, uh, people were concerned um, that we ought to be more uh, detailed in elaborating the stage gate procedure. Uh, we did this uh, in the article in Climatic Change, uh, but obviously haven't gone into detail here in this um, particular draft. Uh, the idea here is that, in fact, that in asking scientific organizations and funders and so on to ensure that there is a process in place to address the high-level principles, and that this be done through a series of stage gates, whereby at each stage of the research, um, before moving on to the next stage, that you then have a complete review of the research program at that stage. And I think the model for this, in fact, was very much uh, the SPICE project uh, in the UK. Many people have talked about the SPICE project, and in fact, uh, I was misreported in uh, one of the, uh, the, the blogs on this conference uh, as having de described it as a failure. Uh, that's not my view. That was the view of the research councils. My view is, in fact, that the cancellation of the spice bloom was a success. It was a success for scientific self-regulation. Uh, and, in fact, uh, it was the product of a stage gate procedure. And it did indeed address the kinds of high-level principles that were embodied in the Oxford principles. Uh, and Matt Watson, when he cancelled the project, his uh, statement issued through the Science Media Centre in the UK uh, made explicit reference to them. Um, the, uh, the final thing that I want to, two things I want to say is that we've also had the suggestion that we should add something on a, uh, a requirement or a, a desire for the various scientific and technical bodies and funding bodies to liaise internationally to forestall jurisdiction shopping. Uh, we think that sounds like quite a good idea and, and again we would appreciate the advice of the meeting on that. And the very last thing I want to say is to reiterate what the moderators have already said. Uh, the, the email that went out today from, I think, Akim uh, was entitled Alternative Text. Uh, I actually don't see that there is an incompatibility between uh, what Clive is proposing and what we're proposing. Even if you agree with everything in Clive's statement, and I have to admit I don't agree with everything in it, I do agree with quite a lot of it actually, but even if you do agree with anything, the question remains what do you do in the meantime? Because you're not going to get that international agreement in place uh, without a fairly extended period of negotiation during which there's going to be pressure to actually have experimentation. So even, I think, if you want to fully endorse Clive's text, it's still perfectly rational for you to support the text that uh, we're putting forward. We certainly don't see them uh, as mutually exclusive alternatives. Thanks. Thank you very much, Steve. Yes, you, actually, you can hold on to that for the time being, um, as long as you don't abuse. So we are open for business. You are the town hall. You are the community. Various of you said that you had things to say. Um, if you get behind a microphone, um, you're going to be able to say them. Um, first come is first served. Gentleman in the blue shirt. Uh, my, my name's Alan Roebuck. Uh, I just, well, I, I was one of the ones that sent in comments, and, and I think there's a, a problem with communication in words. You use the word experiment. And you know what you mean by that, but other people mean different things by experiment. So I think you have to be very explicit and say outdoor experiments. I mean, when I do a climate model simulation, that's an experiment uh, that, that, that we use in a climate model. And so your statement reads like you want to regulate my climate model simulations. And I know you don't mean that, so I just think you have to be a lot more explicit there's other types of indoor experiments, say in laboratories, building nozzles or whatever. And so I think you have to be a lot more explicit about what you mean. 
when you when you use those words. And you use words like kit and stage gate, which Americans have no idea what either of those is. So uh, I know we're not as smart as the British, but I think you have to use more more common. I'm an American, actually. I know, but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yes, you communicate that so clearly. Anyway, I'm just talking about communication. It has to be very simple uh, language that, that people who aren't in this room, who have never even heard of geoengineering before, would understand very simply. Uh, I'm not implying that I'll sign the statement, but I'm just giving you some su su suggestions. OK, that's some specifics. Are we going to have a very short town meeting? No, or I think, uh, is An Andrew and Pablo, are you? Are you, are you actually? What is the, can you? Are you queuing from? Are you queuing from a sedentary position? Yeah, I think. I, which of you was there first? I, I'm too lazy to queue standing up. Um, I just wanted to extend um, the comments that Alan made, um, if I may. The, um, the the concern that I have is that you'll uh, inadvertently regulate experiments which are, although outdoor, climatically trivial. I don't think that we need a new regulatory framework for squirting a bathtub full of water into Oxfordshire. Um, there's plenty of rain in Oxfordshire, it won't hurt anybody. Um, where I think that we do need a regulatory framework is to when you have experiments which have um, significant uh, effects on the, the climate, particularly transboundary implications on the climate. And I think by being specific that we set a high bar for inclusion in this, then we will come up with a statement that, that people will perhaps be more likely to back. And we can potentially tighten it later, but having something which is too loose I think will potentially split the um, uh, people's vote uh, and, and will split the support. So I think it would be best to set the highest bar possible, which is when you have significant transboundary boundary implica implications of an experiment, uh, which I think to have rogue geoengineers going to do that, whether that's be, be that individuals or nation states or scientific groups, that I think we could probably, hopefully, all agree would be bad to do that without having uh, some process behind that. Would anyone like to follow up on Andrew's point directly? Um, audience, town hall, not just, not just asking Steve. Would anyone like to follow up on that point directly at this stage? Um, sorry? Ray, Ray? Ray? I don't get it. OK, thank um, Ray was saying yes. Um, <laughs> broadly, uh, and I'll now, and if you can now pass the microphone back behind you to Duncan. Thanks. Sorry to be uh, um, antagonistic here, but I say no. I think if you set a high bar, you will never push down the bar to a lower position. And as a member of the Spice Stagegate panel, it was exactly the impact of such a allegedly trivial experiment that led to very grave social considerations. So apologies, Andrew, but you're talking nonsense. Robustly said, neighbour. Um, Pablo. <laughs> Speaking of talking nonsense, uh, <laughs> thanks for the invitation. Uh, big gratitude to all of you for spicing things up. Um, <laughs> just like just like Spice taught us something that I think uh, the last uh, speaker of the town hall uh, articulated very clearly, I would like to invite us to think of what we're doing now as an experiment that needs to be studied. Needs, we need the social scientists here to bring analytical rigor. What the hell is going on? Why are things happening the way they're happening? What would have been different if the presentation of the first one had something saying what this is intended to be? What what can we learn of our own, I don't want to call it neither failed nor successful experiment, but it's an experiment that needs to be examined because sooner or later we keep talking about atmospheric chemistry, technologies for deployment, all that kind of research. We need to research how are we going to put something on the table for consideration of a larger group. We're not researching that and clearly based on what's happening here, we are very slow at designing process that can lead to agreement. Thanks. Could I just, Steve, could you speak very briefly to what do you want, what did you want to do with this? What is the desired outcome? Um, other than that there is a letter, I mean, what would have been the why we're doing this bit that, that Pablo was just referring to? Um, yeah, I th yeah, I mean, I think the best thing I can do is respond to Andrew on this, um, which is, of course, there are experiments which are going to be 
trivial, completely trivial in physical terms, as indeed uh, the, the spice uh, balloon experiment would have been. The problem is if we start talking about significant impacts or setting some kind of de minimis level below which we say we don't need to, work to have any kind of oversight at all, we will never find agreement about where that de minimis level or that cutoff level between the significant and the insignificant will be. Different people will have very, very different ideas of where that level should be. And that's why we're suggesting that from the very outset, it's advantageous to the public and to the research community to start as we mean to go on. And to, in fact, in the context of things that are physically trivial, to start to build confidence between the research community and the broader public and the policy world. So that on the one hand, public, the public can have some real sense that the, what is being done is transparent to them. Uh, and that they can uh, they understand and 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 are giving their in, in consent consent to it. And on the other hand, I think it benefits the scientific community in the sense that you're not going to suddenly find people in white bunny suits jumping up and down, trashing your experiment, as as was the case uh, with genetically modified foods. Can I just ask Pablo? Is that an answer to your question? Okay, um, Andrew, I'm, I'm, I'm going to um, pa pa pass over you for Jane at this point um, because she's been queuing longer or has spoken less. Um. I, I, I feel like a rat. <laughs> um, so I, I think that uh, some of the things that people are feeling here because of the way this happened, at least some of the ways I felt, when it became presented as uh, the Berlin Declaration as something that we were sort of Co almost co-opted into, and then uh, now uh, during the day as, as this has hit the press and been misrepresented, and I understand we've corrected it, but it's, um, it, it, it's making me feel very uncomfortable about being co-opted about um, uh, in, in the process. And there aren't many things in here that I don't think are, are, they're certainly worthy of discussion, many things I agree with, many I think that need nuances and wordsmithing, et cetera. But it is really this sense of, um, being co-opted into this process that is very uncomfortable for me. Uh, and, and in the spirit of things that I know you guys have been, you, uh, Steve and Tim, you have been very uh, vocal and articulate about, uh, it, one of the things is transparency. And I would like to ask you to be much more transparent at this time about the motivations for what you're doing and why you, why you brought it to us, why you brought it to us now, why you felt that the Oxford principles weren't enough that you had to do this, and what made you uh, bring, bring it to us in this way, because I don't feel that I understand in, a, in any kind of a public way what your motivation was, and I feel like motivation is a part of trust. If you can't explain your motivation, why you did what you did, what was the basis of the information that you had that caused you to do this, and how good was that information? Did you please disclose to us what led to this, because I feel like that transparency is important for us to trust the process. Okay, so we don't want this to become a Q&A with Steve, but I think that's a question that needs an answer. So, that, yeah. Steve, if you're happy to respond to Jane. Uh, as I said on Monday, it was uh, the, the sense of the authors of the Oxford Principles that the time was ripe, in a sense, to reiterate uh, uh, the kinds of conditions under which uh, we felt uh, research of this outdoor type uh, uh, could go forward. Uh, this was partly uh, driven by kind of the sense that there is a growing uh, urge among certain parts of the research uh, community to want to actually go forward and to begin to propose uh, such experiments, and yet they have been reticent to do so uh, to date because of the lack of some kind of framework uh, under which those might be conducted. Um, there's also a certain amount of pressure from various pressure groups. I did actually name the uh, Arctic Methane Emergency Group uh, uh, in my talk on Monday, who feel that there are, in fact, uh, as we've just had the session this afternoon, impending climatic emergencies that make it imperative that we start to, uh, we, that the scientific community starts to go forward uh, in, and begin some of the research in this area. It's also my personal view that it's actually going to take a very, very long time um, to ramp this kind of research up. 
uh, and that, uh, in fact, uh, I'm fairly sympath sympathetic to those who feel that, in fact, getting more knowledge about these technologies uh, is something that we, uh, we may well, or that we probably ought to be proceeding with in a, in a timely fashion. Thanks, Steve. I would, I'd like to make it very clear, in case there's any ambiguity about this, this was not a response to any particular proposal, and it was not aimed at any particular individual. For, Hugh, are you in the queue there? OK, before we move on to you, do we have any quick, Hang on, quick we've got responses on, on the transparency or what Steve just had said? Is that but by and large, is, is this specifically to Steve's last point or a more general point, Tom? More general. Then if you could take your position, at the, you will encourage that, and then all the people on this side of the room will no longer get a crick in their neck, and they'll be able to look at you. So if you could stand by the... Could you get to the microphone, or is that just... Impo OK, Tom can have a special microphone, um, but... But, but, he, he, but he can't, ha but he but can't, can't have all, it yet. Yeah, but you can't he, all he can't have all it, and you can't have it yet. And wait, Ollie, wait a second. We've got interventions oh, on right. what Jane had to say from Mark, so... Thanks. Jane, I would be curious, in light of what Pablo said before, um, the sense of being co-opted, did you feel like that was an intentional co-opting, or do you think that that was basically an uninformed situation that we don't know how the process works, or we're learning how the process works, and we should learn out of this process exactly what Pablo said, that by doing that in this manner, we can end up with people feeling co-opted, even if that wasn't intended. I can tell you, certainly, there was no intention on, on my behalf of that. But, um, but I'd be curious if you could comment briefly on that, where, what, you, what you mean with, this, with the word co-opted or feeling co-opted, and where that relates to what Pablo suggested about research. Take a response from Jane quick, then we'll go to Tilo, then to Hugh. Well, I mean, I, just from a personal point of view, I, I don't think this process has been useful to what I feel like I'm, I'm trying to achieve. So I think that that... Um, I, you know, and I, I, I think the process where you need to be involved in how things are going to play out, uh, why a statement like this would, what it would do, what its meaning is in terms of the, of the, of the dynamics that are going on in society and particularly in politics. Um, I, I feel like the motivation for it is not clear. And that, I don't... That I, remains your feeling after what I, Steve said. I, yes, I don't think that I heard anything that explained why this is being done now and why it was being done the way it was being done. I just... I, I, just to say we thought we should do it, that's what you said, Steve. We thought we should do it now. I, 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 don't, uh, I don't understand why that um, means. And I, I don't understand whose statement this is anymore. Is this an Oxford statement? Is this, are you trying to make this, a, you know, at one point we were having everybody sign on. Whose statement is it? What does it mean? What's your motivation? I don't understand it. And it's Tilo. Yeah, Tilo Wirtz, ISS uh, Potsdam. Um, I, I have a, a similar concern um, and a similar feeling about the, uh, not actually the content of the declaration or whatever you want to call it, but about the process um, that's been to some degree transparent, well, it's surprising. Like the, in the, at the very first day of the conference, there comes a proposal for Berlin Declaration, apparently trying to use the momentum of a conference that is called Critical Global Discussion, and to some degree, maybe for the first time in the, the history of climate engineering research, brings such a diverse group of people together. And then from a side that has been actually actively working towards more public engagement about geoengineering research. And I was really surprised by the way that then such a declaration was put forward in a way that there was no way to actually engage with it. There was, an, uh, you asked for comments and you, you offered to maybe integrate them into the text. But in a way, using a conference that is about critical global discussions without listening to the conference and the people that are there and actually try to engage it. It's difficult. I see that this would be a really difficult process. I think that town hall experiment is a really interesting one um, and certainly one worthwhile studying. But I think it would have needed such kind of a process to actually develop such a statement to actually have the momentum that I think you were maybe hoping for with it. Thanks, Tilo. I think we should, Hugh's been waiting very patiently. Let's move to the microphone once again. You, please, uh, uh, and um, then Tom. Are you, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, uh, I'm Hugh Hunt. I'm in the Cambridge University Engineering Department, and I work on the SPICE project. Um, I'm, 
in terms of the, the procedure by which this, uh, these declarations are, are, are coming together, I feel strongly that this group here is very poorly uh, representing the scientists and even more poorly representing the engineers who will be most affected by these declarations. And I really think that if we're going to have a proper, full and open discussion, we ought to make sure we do it in a room which has a reasonable number of scientists in it and a reasonable number of engineers. I mean, hands up the engineers. Is that a, is, is that a, is that a reasonable number? Of the, we're the ones who are going to be most affected. Now, that's, I guess, my first point. My second point is that um, I spend a lot of my time when I'm teaching students. I quite often tell them about the SPICE project. I have a lecture, lecture room full of 300 people and I get quite passionate and excited about things. And I get students coming up and say, oh, wow, this is so exciting. Uh, and can I do a PhD with you and so on? And the more I read of these kind of rather threatening documents, I kind of think I just wouldn't want to recommend one of my students to enter into this, in, into this, this rather aggressive pit. Um, now, I, I'm not saying, I'm absolutely not saying that these, these guidelines are not required, but I kind of wish they were worded in a slightly more positive way because surely we want to encourage young, enthusiastic uh, engineers and scientists into the field and make them feel welcome and get their ideas and get their enthusiasm because the pit of young, enthusiastic engineers and scientists will dry up very quickly if we're not careful. Thank you. Tom. Well, thank you for allocating me my personal microphone. I am willing to share. <laughs> um, I'm not an engineer. I did not raise my hand because I know what happens when I get in the laboratory. But um, I do have some of the very same uh, reaction to this. And I guess I would, stepping back, would say it's not clear that you know what it is you want to regulate. And I think when you say you want to regulate something but you don't know what it is, that we're all in trouble. So I can look at this, and when, when I tried to question that the other day, Steve, you immediately backed up and said, oh, this is about, not about you know, clouds, not about marine cloud brightening, it's only about stratospheric aerosol. But now I noticed just a minute ago it was slipping back in that it was about all of these techniques. So I'm back to saying, what are you trying to regulate? And this is so broad that it implies that you would start to regulate things which have been accepted in the community and have been done for years. So um, I'm really worried about the lack of specificity, and I know you want to make it broad. I'm not opposed to the idea that if we're going to do things that look like geoengineering, we ought to consider that. But I'm unwilling to accept the idea that any kind of experiment that's done in the outdoors that might happen to have some application to geoengineering, it suddenly has to go through a regulatory process. Thank you. I wanted to see if there were any people who particularly wanted to address the question that Hugh brought up about, um, rep about the, degree of, of, of the degree to which the people who this mattered to were well or poorly represented in the room. Um, is there anyone else who wants to speak to that particularly? Pablo. Uh, there are uh, billions of people from countries not represented. There are billions of sectors not represented. I'm a former engineer. I didn't raise my hand because I don't think I account for what was being said. I completely agree that it needs to be an inclusive process. If this has to be an inclusive process, we're completely screwed. We need a seven billion room uh, uh, space unless we think harder about the design of processes that are sufficiently inclusive. We have not had that kind of research, that kind of conversation. I don't think we can attack those who are proposing this because of not having enough engineers. It was who was here. The larger issue of all the process, don't get me wrong, I want the Gabonese farmer to be represented here. I want someone to pay for the plane ticket of the Gabonese farmer representative so that his opinions are taken into consideration. I suspect it may not happen. I don't have the money. Okay, we have two people who've already spoken up there. Is there anyone who would like to speak to those points in particular who hasn't spoken yet? Hands? It's very interesting because of the dynamic. This, this side's become much more passive. They all look up there. They think that's where the microphone is. But that's not to shame you into putting up your hands if you don't want to. Rafe. Thank you. Um, uh, 
it, 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 somehow sitting there, it became clear to me what this, what we're actually trying to do and what the authors were trying to do, I think, is that what this is is a debate about policy, about geoengineering policy. Now, if we were to have a national policy in the United States, what would be the components? And the guidelines for research would be one of them. But this conference hasn't been about that. It's not about designing program. I mean, there may have been some workshops that were about that. But so we came in here with one idea, and this, this actually challenges us to talk about how, what a policy of either national or international policy would be, one component of it. It needs a lot more context. So, how to get a win out of a fairly divisive moment. I have a suggestion. Thank, I actually appreciate the issue having been brought forward and getting into a town meeting discussion. It raises a lot of issues. I would suggest that it stop there. That if we want to do geoengineering policy, that's a different meeting. And we say, look, congratulations, we took, people wanted to talk about it, we talked about it, but don't issue a con anything associated with conference because you will have a divisive legacy to the meeting which you don't want. Now, if there are people who feel they've got to make this case, go make it. Form your own organization, go make it, but don't drag the conference into this at this moment because it wasn't set up to do that. Okay, thank you. I think at this point I'd like to um, have Steve reply to uh, Hugh's point and Rafe's point, but briefly, and then I'm going to turn, over the, turn the floor over to Clive. Um, I'm not sure I can adequately address Hugh's point. Um, would I encourage uh, young engineers uh, to build their careers in geoengineering? Uh, actually, probably I wouldn't at this stage. Uh, I might encourage some social scientists to do it, um, but uh, probably not engineers, uh, in all honesty. Uh, I think it is a contentious and dangerous uh, and, and, and difficult area that it may be dangerous for a very early career person uh, to uh, venture into and commit themselves for a long-term period. Um, more generally on this uh, issue of uh, identification with the conference, I, I'm sorry that I wasn't clear enough at the beginning. It was never the intention to co-opt anybody into uh, signing this declaration or being identified with it who was uncomfortable with it, Jane and others. Um, and that was, in fact, exactly why we said we weren't going to put it forward as a conference resolution that we vote up or down on. We would open it up uh, to signatories. As to why we came forward at this time and in the way we did, um, it was very ad hoc. Perfectly honest, it was very ad hoc. As I say, the authors of the principles were uh, talking among ourselves about, you know, in a sense, uh, what, can, what can we do to ensure that these... Uh, uh, norms of transparency and, and, and openness and so on are actually being followed as we move into a phase where we think research is inevitable, outdoor research is inevitable. Uh, and that was our motivation. Uh, we saw an opportunity, as I say, which we identified only last week, to broaden the conversation, not to narrow it down, not to co-op people, but to broaden the conversation by bringing it to the conference. Um, and I think, you know, we've had that conversation. Uh, as to what we would do now, I think it's for us to go away and to consider what we've heard here. Um, it's absolutely clear to me from the applause that at least the people who've bothered to turn up this evening uh, would much prefer us not to talk about a Berlin Declaration. And I think it's pretty 99.9% .9 certain that we won't. Uh, we will revert to the original uh, nomenclature of an open letter uh, on, in this context. Um, and uh, my apologies to anybody who feels uh, that you were in any sense uh, hijacked or coerced. Uh, in fact, just the contrary. Uh, it was our intention to be uh, uh, open and transparent here. Um, as I say, we, uh, we, the normal way in which these open letters occur in the world, as you know, is somebody writes one and sends it around and gets signatures. I think we have at least tried to go uh, beyond that and go in the direction uh, that Pablo has identified, which I think is the right direction. I think we have one... Uh, I think only one burning uh, intervention from Eduardo, then we're going to move on to Clive. Just, <clears throat> I, what about 
I am Eduardo Viola from the University of Brasilia. Just to say that I am, I think it's very useful this discussion. It's the proposal that uh, Steve brought, I didn't know anything about until Monday, but I don't feel any, I feel it is useful, it's just to discuss and uh, we, we could uh, approve, we, can, we could change, we couldn't approve, uh, we could reject anything, but it's very useful to have the discussion because this meeting is probably representative of uh, the state of the art and what are the, the mindsets and what are the issues that are at stake right now. So uh, very few people uh, have uh, some knowledge about geoengineering. So this meeting is representative. This, uh, uh, this discussion is very useful and uh, I don't feel co-opted at all. Uh, to the contrary, I admire uh, the cl uh, clip to have br 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 brought this this question here. <clears throat> Thank you, Eduardo. I was going to um, say, well, Ollie and I spent uh, a good while in the bar last night uh, planning this session. Uh, it was something we weren't certain how best to handle. Uh, we thought we only had one issue to deal with, and then Clive entered the fray. <laughs> um, so, Clive, thanks for uh, making this twice as interesting. Um, we have another statement, which I trust you all have received, uh, that was sent around uh, about lunchtime today. You should have all received a paper copy in the room. Do you want to spend uh, five or so minutes telling everyone about uh, your statement? Why and what it's, what, what it's for. Yeah. yeah, and then we can uh, go to more questions. Thanks very much, and I appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to contribute. Like Jane and I think many others, uh, when Steve stood up on Monday night and announced that there was this uh, Berlin declaration that would be circulated, uh, comments would be called for and then people would be asked to sign it, I immediately started to feel uncomfortable on grounds that have already been uh, expressed particularly strongly by Jane. I felt that perhaps it uh, even more strongly than being co-opted, I was kind of having it foisted uh, on me. Um, and it didn't help, I must say, Steve, when you said on that Monday night, if you really strongly disagree with this statement, then please don't say anything. And, and so, did, did everybody else hear him say that? Don't go there. Okay. Um, and, I was, I was very, and, and I was very worried about the process. Uh, if this was going to be a, a declaration to come out of the conference, which it clearly was, um, then it worried me that uh, the process was a couple of self-selected people would prepare a statement, present it to us, ask us to comment, they would then revise it and then we'd be asked to vote on it, any number of us, or sign it, and then it would uh, go out. And whatever might be said about it, the intention and so on, the truth is that uh, as originally proposed, um, it would always come be represented outside as a product of the Berlin Conference. And no matter what um, Steve and Tim might say, um, the fact is that if you have a document that's called the Berlin Declaration, that's shaped at the, this conference, agreed at this conference, signed at this conference, and probably issued from this conference, then, you know, it will be, it will be a duck. <laughs> yeah, yes, exactly. Um, <laughs> And, um, and so there was a sense in which it really didn't matter what the words were in the document. You know, this is before I'd read it, before I'd heard it. I thought, no, this just sounds wrong uh, to me. And so um, you know, there was a sense of, well, not in my name that I was thinking. And so how, how do we who did not want to sign it distance ourselves? I mean, were we going to have to write letters and say, oh, we just want to remind everyone that some of us didn't agree to this? And then um, when I read the document itself, it seemed to me that whilst uh, in some ways the sentiments were uh, admirable, uh, the, the fact is that it came from a very particular viewpoint. And uh, it just as soon as I read the first sentence or two, it said, um, it starts, new technologies have the potential to provide significant benefits to society, but they can also be controversial. Controversial. And then it says, it's essential that research has a social license to operate. And it goes on to say, to argue how geoengineering researchers can obtain a social license to operate. And it struck me that framing the whole question that way was very much a kind of insider's charter. 
It's thinking about, well, what can be done about David Keith's experiment planned in Arizona or wherever next year? Uh, what can be done in the next six months, 12 months, two years uh, for those kinds of geoengineering experiments that might be in the pipeline or should come up soon? And uh, it seemed to me that uh, it, 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 the, the substance of it didn't, it said this should be done and that should be done, but nowhere did it say who should do it, what kind of institutions, what organisationally uh, would, be, uh, would, would lead to the kind of regulation and restrictions or uh, permissions uh, that might uh, go ahead. And so it seemed to me that um, what we needed is an alternative. Uh, because, you know, the truth is, I think, uh, that the organisers uh, who agreed to allow this declaration to come before the conference kind of got themselves into a hole. And uh, to have uh, before uh, the meeting an alternative uh, would actually open it up rather than narrow things into this, um, this process which had kind of been imposed on us of presenting a pre-written thing, asking for <coughs> comments, asking people to sign and then somewhere putting it out. And so it struck me that it would be helpful to have uh, a very different uh, statement, which I'm not asking anyone to sign, merely to consider, debate, criticise, take away, uh, do uh, whatever you like with it. And the, I'll just spend two minutes talking about the, the motivation uh, for the, uh, the draft that, that I prepared. And it was very much in response to the kind of narrow insider's charter that I thought the original document <coughs> represented. And it's really thinking in the much more the longer term, that we're not talking about geoengineering research that's going to happen in the next year or two or even five years, that those of us who understand what's likely to happen can see a whole process unfolding of research, of more intensive research, of testing, of experimentation, of grander tests, of people starting to talk about deployment when the political floodgates for geoengineering open, the whole landscape will be changed. And I think it's important that people of goodwill, everyone in this room, starts to think about um, how we should build the institutions uh, to try to control this process, which could easily get out of control when we've seen the kind of players already starting to enter into uh, the debate. Uh, so that the kinds of institutions, at least the discussions, are being thought about in advance so that when there is this rush of interest from a whole range of forces who may not have benevolent purposes, then uh, we will not, we, the world community indeed, will not be caught by surprise that there will be thinking, there will be structures, there will be moves to introduce uh, a democratic uh, anticipatory regulatory framework that can think in the long term about how the world must deal with this problem of geoengineering research. Thanks very much, Clive. Now, uh, we have relatively, well, we have very short time left now. Um, we have um, three excellent questions, I'm sure, up there, which are to some extent a residue of things that were said earlier. If people want to say things directly about Clive, um, quickly and directly, yes, you've got the, uh, yeah, go and stand at um, what was previously Eduardo's microphone and is now everyone's microphone. Um, Alan, please. I think uh, one of the issues which is sort of implied by the original statement which hasn't been addressed is that uh, the first sentence in that original statement implied that nuclear reactors are good and genetic engineering is good and protests about it have harmed this advances in, in science. And it, it, uh, it only mentioned that these were good and that didn't say anything about their negative aspects. And that was the impression I got from it. And you even mentioned today people in bunny rabbits are a pro costumes are a problem because they protest genetic modification. But these very strong technical issues really do have dangers as well as benefits. And that has to be recognized. The, okay. I the idea that we have to do outdoor experiments or we can't do science is something else which a lot of people say, well, I don't trust models, so we've got to go outdoors and do it, and period. And, I think and you made that point earlier, Adam, uh, Alan, and I'm sorry, we really have about 10 minutes left. Yes, given, my name is Jürgen Schäffern. Uh, given the controversy on this subject, it may be difficult to get a declaration, but you could make a benefit out of this uh, controversy and document it, see it as the first step in a debate. So you could rather see this as a discussion memo coming from this conference and invite more other memos or declarations 
in association with this. So this could be a process rather than one declaration. The declaration sounds like you declare a certain opinion at a certain time. But I would rather make it um, a set of different declarations, memorandums, discussion documents, and document this on the website or maybe put them all together in one form or the other. So this would be a way of document the debate. I, th I, I think that de facto that may indeed be kind of what's going to happen. I, I think, and um, Mark might want to speak this, my position is that the, my perception of the position of the steering committee is that none of this is coming from the conference as an entity. It may be coming from the Scandic Hotel at this time, or it may not. And I think, and we're going to, and we're going, and I'm going to ask people to show their feelings about that towards the end. Um, and I'm now going. Ollie, and, should, should, we just, should we just confirm that with? Can we? Yeah. Confirmed. Okay, that's confirmed. <laughs> Andrew, can On you be go. equally succinct? Super. We really are down to about five minutes. We do not want to disrespect the people who've prepared things for the rest of the evening. Yeah, I'll be brief. Um, I'd, love, I'd love to sign a document similar to this, but um, the, draft, Sorry, the, the, the Berlin Declaration, so-called. Um, the, but the problem is it reads like a test ban treaty, not like a regulatory proposal. Um, my question is simply on this. Will Ken still be allowed to paint his drive uh, white? If he does, does the intention he has matter? And if his intentions were good when it started okay, and the experiments you. later, what can he do? I think you both. Thank you, Andrew. Duncan. Thanks. I agree that there shouldn't be a Berlin Declaration. But Rafe also said to some applause that this conference was about science and not policy. And I am gravely disappointed to hear that. Because if we separate science from policy, we miss all the lessons of spice and decades of science policy interactions. That's why a process like this and a statement like this is needed. And that's why it has to engage the scientists, not some groups from outside coming and imposing it. So don't try artificially to separate science and policy. Please. Um, I, I, I welcomed both statements and I sent some comments to Steve about the original proposed draft. I certainly like uh, some of what's in Clive's document as well. But it's clear to me that uh, two things. One is the discussion is not closed about either of those documents. There's, uh, there's a lot to be said and a lot in people's minds. And if we, we had more time to engage with Clive's document, I'm sure there'd be quite a lot to be said too. The second thing that's clear to me is that we have here uh, uh, an emerging, well, we, a collectivity of some sort. We, we've formed a lot of mutual insights because we've all been together. And so I'd like to suggest that what should come out of this is at least a capacity to be able to engage collectively after the conference is finished. It could be a very simple thing, just a, a list serve to which we could subscribe or unsubscribe with our emails, so that at least we could have a conversation. I would suggest that the two documents that are currently under discussion could be circulated, there could be adequate time for people to respond in different ways through email, and then the, 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 the owners of those statements can decide what they want to do with them. That's all. Thank you very much. You could, it's almost like you were trying to close out the meeting, which, alas, we now kind of have to do. I'd be interested in taking, actually, Steve asked me to do something. On, I'd be interested in taking a preliminary, just so you find out whether your shoulders work. Um, do people feel that they, that they are more interested, going back to the original document, in having something specifically about stratospheric aerosols rather than SRM in general, which rather speaks to Andrew's point about? Yeah, we are. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm just, no, I'm only asking for, for I'm, I'm asking for a show of hands of interest in people thinking this is something that Steve asked me to do well, well, on whether, on whether the, on whether we, on whether they, the uh, SRM, uh, aerosols rather than SRM. That was my understanding. But Steve's now saying, no, don't worry about that. So I will move on <laughs> and not worry about that. Is it the, uh, can I ask for a show of hands on the general sense that something along the lines of that last comment is where people want to go, that they want no statement associated directly with the conference, they would like, um, op they would be interested in being able through some sort of like email discussion to associate or not associate themselves with one or more open letters in the weeks to come. Is that what people are generally thinking? No? The question is, are, are people in general in favor of, actually, I'm, 
You put this shorter then. I, tried, I, thought, I thought I put that pretty short. Um, I think, yeah, I think breaking it into two pieces okay. would make sense. So would people in general uh, favour not having a conference, conference statement or declaration? Show of hands, please. Not. 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 OK. I think that's a comfortable majority. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> would people uh, favour following this up by email to see about a self-organised uh, statement, series of statements, um, and uh, can Stefan facilitate this? Yeah. Show of hands, please. <laughs> <laughs> so, in, interest in following this up by email, please. Show of hands. OK. OK, so a decent, decent number. OK, well, thank you very much for giving us of your time. There's, oh, and I would like to point out there's going to be a great session in this room in, I think, realistically, half an hour from now. Let's, yeah. let's hear about um, OK, here's my pitch. This is a really important issue. We're looking at the impacts of CO2 on the oceans. This is obviously linked with the issue of um, climate engineering. 90% of the biosphere lives in the ocean, and there's a prediction that by 2050, 60% could go extinct um, due to climate change. So not a small issue. And I hope you turn up. We've got a great um, slate of panelists. So please join us. And before that, the next there is an artistic presentation going on in AB2, which will start as soon as you all go in there, I imagine. Thank you all very, Thank very you. much for your time. Thank you.